I'm really excited to introduce <laughs> Professor Misha Lebrov from Kennesaw State University, who's going to talk to us about fantastic cycles and why you should want to find them. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the introduction and for inviting me here. I guess the title of the talk is a little bit strange, so let me explain why I called the talk that name. It's because it's going to have two parts to it. And the first part is my story of how I ended up working on the second part and what really made me want to prove a theorem about Hamiltonian cycles of all things. So I've recently learned from Emily sitting behind the camera that whenever you give a talk about Ramsey numbers, you start with the same theorem. If you color uh, the complete graph on six vertices, red and blue, and we get um, a red or a blue triangle. And, and the first theorem that I want to actually talk about is actually a very close cousin of this one. So the theorem that I have the names and dates and notes for. Audrey and Shelp in 1974. If we color K3n minus 1, red and blue. And of course, I should probably say that the edge color in both cases. This gives us a monochromatic. C2n uh, cycle of length 2n. And here we're only interested in the even cycles and the reason for that is odd cycles are much easier to avoid and for that reason the problem becomes a little less interesting for them. So if you want to avoid a long odd cycle you just uh, color so that one color gives you a bipartite graph and has no odd cycles and the other graph has no large components and so it has no long odd cycles. And so then everything is a little bit sad. But with um, even cycles, you can do slightly better than with odd cycles, and we get this result. And so lots of people have thought about that. The reason that this result continues to be interesting even after that theorem is proved is because actually these two theorems are very different. So with this theorem, Every single edge of that K6 is necessary because if you leave out just a single edge, you can draw a picture like this. So I'm going to draw this pentagon and another one very much like it. I'm going to draw a five-pointed star inside one pentagon and another one very much like it. Essentially, by leaving out that edge, I can treat these two top vertices exactly the same and reconstruct the construction for a five vertex clique inside the six vertex clique missing an edge. And so leaving out just that single edge, I can color the whole thing without getting a red or blue triangle. And that continues to be the case for the usual generalization of this theorem if we're looking for large cliques. Every single edge of the complete graph ends up being necessary. But here, fewer edges are necessary. So lots, um, there are lots of subgraphs of this, of K3n minus 1, that continue to have the same property, that if you color their edges um, red and blue, you get a monochromatic C2n. So for instance, people have looked at, at bipartite subgraphs. of various kinds, you can play around with the sizes of the parts. K, N, N, N minus one, that turns out to be enough. Multipartite things. And the thing that I will be talking about is some kind of minimum degree. So the minimum degree bound, if you have 
a subgraph of k3n minus 1 that still has a high minimum degree on every vertex, then the same edge coloring result holds for it as for all of k3n minus 1. And so that's the problem we were working on. So the conjecture did a shelf was uh, min degree 3 times the number of vertices of g over 4, approximately, is enough. And the theorem, so this was joint work with Sasha Kostichka. Oh no. <laughs> uh, she followed out. The titles were, the names were in the correct alphabetical order on the paper. It is just that I am bad at the alphabet. And me and Shijun Ryu. So this was all done at UIUC. We proved that actually this is enough, and so specifically, a subgraph of K3 and minus 1 with min degree and 3 n plus 1 over 4, I think. No, 3 n minus 1 over 4 has the same property. And so Shelp's conjecture was actually made for P2n, but we're mostly going to ignore that because we can actually prove that there's a cycle of length 2n. And the cycle gives us the path as well. I'm not sure if it immediately gives us the path or if Shelp meant that this thing actually has 2n plus 1 vertices. But either way, uh, we can get both the path and the cycle, and the cycle is a little bit harder. So by this time, we had actually looked at several versions of theorems like this, and there has over the years developed a little bit of an engine for how uh, you prove these results, because there is similar in flavor. So the fine print of this is that if n is very, very large, and the reason that n needs to be very, very large because the first thing you do is do something with the regularity lemma to get some kind of stability result. And so in our case, for this problem, somebody had already proven the stability result for us, and then they graciously let us actually solve the conjecture. So uh, the stability was Benefitas, Jack, Scott, Go again and wait. And so the sort of thing that we can say is that either we get um, a cycle of lots of possible lengths, maybe any length we want, or in, we're in one of two dangerous cases. And the dangerous cases are interesting to look at. So this is just the background, so I get to pick and choose the most fun parts of this result to mention. And so the most fun parts are the extremal cases, where we're close to an extremal case. And the extremal case explains why all the parts of our theorem are the way they are. So why do we need 3 and minus 1 vertices? And why do we need a 3 quarters min degree? And so there's two separate constructions, one for each of those. So the first one is actually something that was a problem from the very beginning. It is the reason for the 3 and minus 1 over here. And it's a picture that looks as follows. So we have um, a 3 and minus 2 vertex graph. So this has 2 and minus 1 vertices over here n minus 1 vertices over here, so one less than the thing that actually gets us the cycle. And so here I might color all the edges inside here <coughs> one color, all the edges going across over here a different color, and over here inside here the color can be anything. So 
So that's a color of the complete graph. And for um, a subgraph with some min degree, I'm just saying that all the edges that actually exist inside these places get the colors I specified. And if they don't exist, then of course it doesn't matter what color they don't have because they don't exist. And so in this picture, what goes wrong? Well, the blue graph over here only has two n minus one vertices, not enough to get the cycle. And it, there might be some blue edges over here, but they can't get to these. The red graph, meanwhile, has to alternate between the two halves because it's bipartite over here. And even if there are any red edges over here, they're not going to help us because they'll just help us use more and more of these vertices, which are a rare resource. And so we run out of vertices on the right, and so then we are in trouble. And so this is the first extremal case, and that's why this 3n minus 1 is there, because for 3n minus 2, we get this picture. Is it fine if I continue writing over here for the camera? All right. The second picture is why the minimum degree should be 3 quarters. So here we have a picture where this is about n over 4, and there's four parts of size about n over 4. And now, inside each of these, as before, the color can be anything. And I'm going to connect these by red edges, these by mm, the vertical ones by blue edges. And the diagonal pairs are not going to have edges between them at all. And so here, the minimum degree is getting close to 3 and over mm, minus 1 over 4 or something along these lines. But at the same time, each connected component in both red and blue is small. And as a result, we don't get the large cycle we want because we can't even get a component of that size. So somehow, actually, at this minimum degree, the longest cycle we can find of a color jumps significantly. Over here, it's just size half of the total number of vertices, so that's maybe 3 halves n. And once we're past this threshold, it jumps up to 2n. And actually, we can even do slightly better than this. Uh, technically, we can also insert one or two vertices in the middle, one of which will just have red edges to everything, and the other one will have blue vertices to everything at least if we're trying to get the cycle and not the path, we can add these vertices. And the reason is that, sure, a path can use up all the vertices at the top with red edges, go to the center vertex, and then go to the bottom, use up all these vertices. But a cycle would then have to come back to where it started, and if the center vertex is the only way to do that, then you can't have a cycle. So these are the two pictures. And so what a stability result says here is that you'll have these pictures, except that each vertex might misbehave on a small fraction of its edges, and there's a small fraction of the vertices at the end that just do whatever they like. So apart from that, we are either uh, in one of these pictures, or we get all the paths and cycles we could ever dream of. And so then, how do we go about getting from the stability result to something that actually gets us the exact cycle that we're looking for. Question? Yeah, before you go on, uh, about that stability result of Benavides set up, mm -hmm. uh, is it very general or does it relate to this problem specifically? It's specific to this problem. So we're in one of these cases. If um, we do not get so what we can say is, if we do not have, uh, I think, a connected matching, so a matching inside of connected component of a large size in one of the colors. Sorry, I said that in an incoherent way. So either there is a red connected component with a large red matching inside it, which is a necessary prerequisite for a long red cycle, or the same thing happens in blue, or we're close to one of these things. So their result for this would not be solving Shelp's problem with a plus epsilon n. That's still not enough because you have these 
large matching conditions as well as extremal cases. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think the result does imply. Um, the result implies Shelp's conjecture with an epsilon here and an epsilon here. All right. So here is some way that we might uh, try to make progress from the stability, uh, or from one case of the stability, uh, to a cycle of length two n. So for instance, most any introductory graph theory class will mention Dirac's theorem. So if you have n at least three vertices and minimum degree at least n over two, that gives us a Hamiltonian cycle. So, um, fun fact, this Dirac is not the same as the physicist Dirac, and you can remember this by a mnemonic. This one is Gabriel Dirac, G Gabriel for graph theorist, the other one is Paul Dirac, P for physicist. And um, Gabriel was actually uh, Paul's adopted stepson. It's very touching. <laughs> anyway, armed with this theorem, we can try to do something about this case. So imagine that we're in the situation where we have um, maybe 1.99 n vertices over here, 0.99 n vertices over here, 0.02 n vertices over here, and otherwise the coloring is as I described over there, maybe with the colors swapped. I didn't promise that the colors aren't swapped. And of course, some of these edges are misbehaving in a different color. So suppose we can find at least 0.1n of these have at least n red edges to the left. So at least half of these have lots and lots of red edges to this part. Then we can just take those uh, vertices, dump them into here, and look at what graph we have over here. And that's a graph with two n vertices. It has minimum degree n because that's true for the edges we added, and it's true for the uh, it's true for the vertices we added, and the vertices that were already there. The vertices already there are actually in even better shape. And then by Dirac's theorem, there's a Hamiltonian cycle in the thing we create, which is the red cycle we wanted. And so this is the sort of argument you have to use to deal with these cases. And of course, each case gets split up further into what do these extra vertices do and which color cycle do we want to try to get. And actually, Dirac's theorem is unfortunately asking for a bit too much well-behaved properties from these vertices. And it's not quite enough to do that. What we end up doing is using some more complicated theorems that um, say more complicated degree conditions about these. And the more of these cases you solve, the more complicated the theorems you need. So um, there's an amazing graph theory textbook not like any other graph theory textbook. And that's Berge's graphs and hypergraphs, which I don't know, is probably not very good for the intro graph theory class that teaches this theorem, but it was very good for us because you go to chapter 10 and it's just theorem upon theorem upon theorem upon theorem that gives minor variations on these conditions for a Hamiltonian cycle. Just for the purposes of illustrating what these are like, let me give you a theorem we actually used for one of these cases, maybe for some other related problem. This is Las Virgnes from 1970. So here we have a bipartite graph. We have degree u1 less than or equal to degree of u2 through degree of un on one side. On the other side, degree of v1 
through degree of Vn are all ordered as well. And the condition that we have is that if an edge uivj is not present, and if ui um, and vj both have some degree conditions, the exact things will not be important for our talk. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of what these look like. So if you have all of this, then we can have a Hamiltonian cycle through any Q edges that are not terrible. And not terrible is hard to say, but it's essentially the obvious condition. If I give you three edges all out of the same vertex, you're not going to be able to find a Hamiltonian cycle that uses all three of those edges, and then you're in trouble. But if I don't give you any edges that purposefully sabotage you like that, then with all these three conditions, you can get a Hamiltonian cycle. And so this theorem is, first of all, one we actually use at some point, and second, illustrates all the twists and complexity that you can add to these theorems, which is you can have a bipartite graph or some kind of different host graph, and you can have weirder degree conditions like this, and you can have a Hamiltonian cycle that doesn't just you know, use up all the vertices, but also uses some specific edges in case you need that for some reason. And so this theorem has all of those twists. Unfortunately, when we were dealing with this particular problem, uh, Berge's graphs and hypergraphs was not enough for us, because it turns out the words Hamiltonian cycle are, you know, a big crowd pleaser. You want to say that you've proven a result about Hamiltonian cycles. Once you have something that is not a Hamiltonian cycle, technically, even if it's just as cool as a Hamiltonian cycle would be otherwise, it's much harder to find theorems about it. And so the theorem uh, we have, that's actually Jackson in 1981, was that if you have a picture like this, you have a bipartite graph that's very unbalanced. One side x is much smaller than the other side y. This has a cycle of length two times the size of x, which is the best you could possibly hope for. It uses up all the vertices at the bottom and however many it needs to at the top. If the following condition holds, so first of all, size of x has to be at least two, otherwise you get no cycles. And second, that for all vertices at the bottom, the degree is at least two things. It's at least x and it's at least y plus 2 over 2. And so this turned out to be the final uh, theorem that we needed. So all of this is just to, in part to advertise the reason for so many Hamiltonian cycle conditions. You might think that once you get to the Rocks theorem, maybe something like Orris theorem, that you can stop, but you can never stop. <laughs> Graph theorists need more and more and more Hamiltonian cycle theorems. We can never have enough. No matter how many you prove, we will always need more. So now we come to part 1.5 of the talk, which is the unfortunate word pancyclic graph. So the word pancyclic graph was made, made up by Bondi in 1971. So the theorem essentially says that the conditions of Dirac's theorem, and Bondi this not just for Dirac's theorem, but for a whole bunch of theorems that had piled up by that time, imply that there's a cycle of every length, three, four, five, all the way up to n. And so this was called G is pancyclic. And it's very tempting and very interesting to find out 
Um, can we get a cycle of every possible length in various cases? Sometimes you can't quite get that, but for instance, um, we can also prove in the case of our theorem that also one color has cycles of every even length. four, six, eight, and so on, up to two n in our cases. So let me remind you that there are three n minus one vertices at this point. We find in the cycle of length two n, and actually we get all shorter even cycles as well. And once again, some odd cycles in that range might be hard to fill in, because if in a picture like this it turns out to be the blue graph, the one with edges going across, that gets you the cycles. And if, in fact, both of the other parts are red, then the blue graph will only have even cycles, and you might have a much shorter length of the longest odd cycle there is. And so sometimes this is the best we can say, but we can say that much. So unfortunately, when Bondi invented the word pancyclic, Bondi wasn't thinking big enough. So these are all the things you can do to Dirac's theorem and to our theorem. But Jackson's theorem is even better. So a corollary of Jackson's theorem, and this turns out to be very easy to prove, that, we, that for every set, every subset of the vertices in X, there is a cycle of length twice the size of A using those vertices. So not only do I get to pick the length of the cycle, but I get to pick half of the vertices it uses. I say, I want this one, this one, this one, and this one. And there's a cycle of length 4 plus 4 using exactly those four vertices in x and some four vertices in y. And the proof of this is that you just delete all the vertices in x that are not in the set you picked. And all of these conditions continue to hold. And so you immediately get this corollary. And this sounds even cooler if you phrase it in the language of hypergraphs. So hypergraphs and bipartite graphs are actually exactly the same thing. Rather than thinking we have a bipartite graph that looks like this, we can say that we have a hypergraph where the vertices are the things on the bottom, the edges are the things at the top, and sort of when normally we would say we have a vertex adjacent to these four things, now we say there is an edge containing these four vertices. And so in hypergraph world, if we have a hypergraph H with min degree, where the hypergraph has min degree, let's see, the maximum of the number of vertices and the number of edges plus 2 over 2, then there is a cycle, I should say a bare cycle, and I'll explain what that means in a moment, based on any set of vertices. So what is a bare cycle? So let me draw you the picture. So if I want to cycle in a hypergraph through some specific vertices, now of course we no longer have edges, we have hyper edges, and so there are sets of vertices, and what I want is sets that look like this. So this is a nice and and interesting picture. So we all agree that something like this should be a cycle. A bare cycle is something that superficially looks like this, but is allowed to be arbitrarily badly behaved otherwise. So we might take this edge and say, OK, so this edge has to contain those two vertices. But you know, that edge could, you know, share, also contain all of that edge, and maybe this vertex as well. 
and maybe some other overlap with those vertices and could contain any number of other vertices you want. So you have to have a sequence of edges that where every edge contains the two vertices it's supposed to contain and then they're also allowed to contain anything else you like. I do want these to be distinct edges. It's no fair to use the same edge twice in the cycle, of course. But other than that, I'm making no restrictions. And so this bare cycle in the hypergraph exactly corresponds to the cycle we find in this corollary. And so in this language, it's much more impressive what we've accomplished. Pick any vertices, and there's a cycle through exactly those vertices and nothing else. This is ridiculous in graph theory land, but it's accomplishable in hypergraph theory land. And at that point, you start really regretting Bondi's choice of language, because this is the thing that we should be calling pancyclic. Unfortunately, that word was already taken, so we have to call these graphs super pancyclic. <laughs> Not just super cyclic. We also use the word supercyclic. In our terminology, supercyclic refers to the bipartite graph, and superpancyclic refers to the hypergraph. I'm not sure why we settled on that, but that's what we end up using. Yeah, I think maybe you could have used walk cyclic. Walk cyclic? As opposed to a pan. <laughs> 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 Okay, so now the question that we uh, looked at next is the following question, and this is coming to part two of the talk. When is my part end graph super -sentic? And this is going to be with respect to the smaller side. X, where usually we'll think of these as being unbalanced in general, just as in this picture. X will be the smaller side, Y will be the larger side. And we want a property like this, that for every set of vertices on the smaller side, you can complete those vertices to a cycle of twice that length. So, there are some necessary conditions, and so I will actually state a, slight, a slightly weaker version of what we ended up saying in the paper. So this question was studied by a slightly different group of people. So this was Sasha Kostachka, me, Ruth Lowell, and Dara Zirlin. And so still some overlap with the previous group. And actually it was the discovery of Jackson's theorem that made both groups very, very happy. One group because we could prove the theorem we wanted, and the other group because Jackson had already stated an open conjecture that they could then solve. And then I joined them for the part that was to come. And so the conditions that we found for a bipartite graph to be super cyclic, I'm going to say it slightly differently because in the paper, we were motivated by the hypergraph case. And so in the hypergraph case, you want to pick at least three vertices on this side and at least three vertices on that side because we don't want to think of this as a cycle. But in the bipartite graph case, there is no reason to forget about the four cycles and so in that case, the condition is um, slightly nicer to state. So if we let uh, and the lambda of the set S to be, so if S is a subset of the set X to be the set of vertices in Y such that Y has at least two neighbors in S, So there's a clear necessary condition. We need the size of this lambda of S to be at least the size of S for all subsets of X. Because for every subset of X, we need at least that many vertices at the top to be adjacent to at least two of them because those are the vertices that we're going to be using in the cycle. 
through this set S. Each vertex we use in the cycle will have this property, and so there have to be at least as many such vertices as the number of vertices we picked in X. And so this is necessary, and our conjecture is that it's also sufficient. So this was very exciting because it sounds a lot like Hall's theorem. And when you write something down that looks a lot like Hall's theorem, but for Hamiltonian cycles, you feel like you have written something crazy at first. Then you realize maybe this is not crazy because we're asking for uh, something a lot stronger from Hall's theorem than usually for Hamiltonian cycles. And so maybe this works out. And in fact, we have not managed to disprove our conjecture. <laughs> so let me say what we know and also what Jackson knows sort of in the same language. So what we prove that, so let's call this condition star that star implies all the cycles you want of the following lengths, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And then at 12, we stop. We have not gotten to 14 yet. I've sort of vaguely thought about 14, but uh, at that point, it gets tricky, yes? Are you requiring the degree condition also, or merely this lambda condition? So far, we're not requiring a degree condition, but I'll talk about a degree condition as well. So just this lambda condition by itself is enough for all the short cycles. And uh, at least I hope, I think Sasha was pessimistic <laughs> that it's enough for all the cycles. And so. Uh, of course, this by itself does not feel like enough to publish a paper about because the, these are tricky problems, but they're actually finite problems. Because you can say, OK, if you're looking for a cycle on set S, then you're not going to be using any other vertices from X. So you can throw those away. And then at the top in Y, you might have, in theory, arbitrarily many vertices. But most of them you're not going to use. And so you can limit yourself to some finite number of vertices of every type that is connected to every subset of the vertices in X that you're using. And so at that point, you have some large but finite uh, set of graphs for which you want to prove there's a cycle. We might have been slightly cleverer than brute force in checking that those cycles exist. But that by itself is just a finite problem. Proving that would be the really exciting thing. So what we also did was think about what happens in uh, the minimum degree condition. So, so let me give you a set of graphs. So G N M delta. So this is graphs with size of x equal to n, size of y equal to m, and the degree of x at least delta for all x on the small side. And so for these graphs, so first of all, let's say what Jackson proves again, uh, that if delta is at least the max of n and m plus 2 over 2, that gets us a cycle of length 2n. And we did a number of things from here. So just my co-authors without me. <laughs> Before I found out about this problem, said that if we have something like m plus 5 over 3 instead, and 2 connected, that is also enough for a C2n. And so why is this different? Because how does Jackson uh, decide that this picture 
that condition is what we need because we can imagine some kind of situation where um, at some point you just have uh, a picture that looks like this. You can just have two pieces in x, two pieces in y that don't interact at all. And then, obviously, you're not going to get a cycle through all of x. You can even have one vertex uh, that's sort of a connecting point like this. And once again, that one vertex is not enough to save anything, because a cycle can't pass through it lots of times. And so this is sort of the reason for Jackson's degree condition. And so if you uh, require that this vertex not exist because the graph is too connected, then maybe you can do better. And so that's a thing that actually Jackson conjectured and my co-authors proved. And so then from there, you can uh, do a couple of other things. So you can say that if you have some weaker condition on delta, and you're three connected, then you have C2n. And here, once again, you can come up with a similar picture, but with two vertices that are the bottleneck. It'll end up having some more vertices at the top, but it looks very similar. But if you um, avoid that picture by saying that it's three connected, then you can bring this number down a little. And finally, to bring star in, so if, again, delta is at least max n of n plus 10 over 4, and now we have the condition star, then that gives us C2n. So we don't know if this condition is sufficient yet, but we do know that it's at least sufficient to replace three connectivity. So it defeats the sort of situations where uh, the graph is, does not have a cycle because it's not three connected. And so that's some evidence that actually that conjecture is true. It at least lets us do better. And possibly it will continue to let us do better if you lower this number, which is tricky. Unfortunately, we have not made any progress in lowering that number. And depending on how I'm doing on time, I might be able to say something about why. Five minutes. All right. So let me sort of tell you about how things like this um, can get proved. So this was probably how Jackson did it, and then it was how we did it. So you have some kind of cycle, and you want to make it bigger. So this is proven by induction, not necessarily on n, but by the length of the cycle. So we have some cycle that has many vertices, not all of x. And you have some central vertex um, x that you're hoping to add into the cycle. And whether it is by connectivity or by this condition star, we can say that this vertex x does not live entirely alone and unloved. It can actually has some ways to get to the cycle. And these ways could be very long and indirect. By the time this cycle gets really, really big, those paths to the cycle are basically just edges, or maybe two-step things through y and then back to x. But if we have some kind of picture like this, and we choose this picture carefully, um, so for instance, we could try to maximize the number of these paths. And so at this point, how can we try to win? So we can try to win in two ways. So first of all, we can try, of course, to extend the cycle. But a backup win condition for us is if we prove that actually this degree condition is violated, that there's more vertices than we thought there are. So that's uh, another win condition. And so, um, um, if um, we look at a vertex, then actually we know 
it has lots of neighbors, at least delta neighbors. And so you think, OK, well, we want to show that y has at least four delta uh, vertices in it. So just take any four vertices in x. They'll have four delta neighbors. And there, you've proved the theorem. And of course, that doesn't work, because some of those neighbors could overlap. So let x plus to be uh, sort of the vertices in x clockwise from the circle vertices up there. And the vertices in x plus are relevant because these are in a bit of trouble. They can have no common outside neighbors. So suppose that we have a picture where this vertex and this vertex have a common neighbor outside the cycle. Then we can draw a picture that looks like this. And so now this is a longer cycle that used every vertex of x on the old cycle and also uses this vertex in the middle. We've done better. And so these vertices are in a bit of trouble because if you look at all their neighborhoods, outside x, those neighborhoods have to be disjoint. And so it seems like this is finding us lots and lots of vertices in y, but not necessarily because these vertices could have only a few neighbors outside the cycle and lots of neighbors on the cycle. And neighbors on the cycle don't all have to be distinct. There could be lots of repeats. So now let me draw you the second picture. So for the second picture, things are very similar. And now suppose that we have a picture like this. So this is a vertex um, that we can call a crossing. So the crossing by itself doesn't quite do anything, so, uh, but it does two things. So first of all, the crossing could replace the center x. So you can, instead of find a cycle that goes through x and uses most of these but leaves out that vertex, so we could swap it out. And because we choose that picture carefully, that crossing has few neighbors on the cycle. And second, crossings can't have common outside neighbors uh, just like what we had in that picture. Because let me draw you another picture. So something that looks like this. And now these two vertices have a common outside neighbor. Now let's see if I can figure out what the cycle has to look like. This is a bit of detective work, but OK, we have to use this stretch over here. We have to use this. We have to use this. And we have to use this. And so now, suppose that we go this way, then we have to go this way. And I think that this creates a longer cycle. So something like this is certainly true, but I can't vouch that I got this exact picture right. And so these crossing vertices are in a lot of trouble because they can't have common neighbors on the outside, but they also can't have many neighbors on the inside at all. And so if we find lots of crossings, then we have to win because they have lots of neighbors outside the cycle. And all of those sets are disjoint. And so that's lots and lots of vertices in y. And that's how sort of the easy case of all of these theorems goes. And why do we get lots of crossings? That's because of this n over here. And that's the part we can't improve in any of these. The n guarantees that over here, when these vertices have no out common outside neighbors, they have lots of neighbors on the cycle. And since the length of the cycle is comparable to this degree, we know that that actually creates lots of crossings. So at this point, the tricky things where we use these connectivity conditions at some point 
is dealing with cases where there are actually not too many vertices in the first place, where the number of these paths is very small all the time, and you get somewhere just by saying that with high connectivity the number can't be too small, but for best results you actually try to handle the borderline cases with lots of casework, and that's what you need to get close to these numbers where there's a construction saying you can't do better. And so that's where the state of the art is right now, but of course the real prize is trying to figure out why this condition is true. And I think that's where I should stop for now because I'm two minutes over. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah. I have a question about uh, the first theorem you presented. So you, um, you show that the degree condition implies the existence of a monochromatic uh, cycle of elective one. Yes. Suppose I add one to that minimum degree. How many uh, monochromatic cycles might I get in the sense of a supersaturation result? Mm. I have the suspicion that in the sense of a supersaturation result, you don't even need to add one. That as soon as you get one cycle of the correct, uh, that's monochromatic, you already have lots of cycles that are monochromatic. I don't think we actually proved that, but I have the intuition that it ought to be true just because the barriers to this are not that you just barely have the edges for a cycle, it's that, for instance, you run out of vertices on one side of a bipartition, or you just barely manage to connect two components or something like that. And in all of those cases, it seems like you have lots and lots of flexibility, it exponential was, flexibility in sort of what other vertices you choose that are not the bottleneck. Yeah, it would seem to me that, that the way you might show this is you apply the previous theorem, the um, Benavides et al. theorem, if, the, if you don't get close. Then you get many copies because you just, you get them so easily that you just delete vertices or something, mm -hmm. and delete edges, I guess delete edges and do it. And then when you're close to these extreme cases, then as you say, your results basically just give these, either these big dense graphs mm -hmm. or big dense bipartite graphs, and then that should yeah. give you lots of copies. Yeah, but actually if we look closely at how the non-extremal cases work, that's when we use the regularity lemma, and so then we're, we have essentially big bipartite graphs with lots of a color where we could basically do anything and we stitch those together into a long cycle. And I imagine that the parts where you have um, regular pairs that are, have lots of a color, then you get in those exponentially many different paths you could take. Um, yeah. Why are uh, odd cycles not interesting or, e or easy? So for odd cycles, we have the following picture. So I take so for odd cycles, c two n plus one versus c two n plus one, the minimum is four n plus one vertices. Because with four n vertices, you put two n vertices over here, two n vertices over here. Uh, you color everything inside those blue and everything going across red. And so here also, in red, you don't get an odd cycle at all. In blue, the odd cycles have length at most 2n, minus 1. And so we could also prove similar results here, but somehow they're a bit of a letdown. Actually, one other related thing is that the cutoff for a cycle of length 2n is also, broadly speaking, both the cutoff for a path of the same length and the cutoff for a, any cycle of at least that length. So there's lots of related problems that all come true at the same time, whereas the odd cycle um, comes true at a slightly later time because of this reason. I'm not sure I mean to apply that this one is definitely less interesting, but somehow once you're at this point, it will probably get easier to do everything that's not dealing with this exact problem. So everything else becomes much easier. Other questions? All right, it's like we shut down.